And okay, so this is open source facial recognition and mass surveillance with Ian O'Neill. Ian is a writer of hacking tutorials with an interest in surveillance, counter surveillance, and making memes with machine learning. Please welcome Ian to ShellCon uh, 2018. All right, my research uh, doing facial recognition, machine learning, and spe specifically mass surveillance was essentially me trying to investigate how easy it is to do the sorts of things that we're now seeing on the nation state level for security and kind of the goods and bads of that. So even with those kind of ethical issues aside, I wanted to learn how is this done and more specifically, how can we break it? So to begin, I'd like to take a look at just a few of the current implementations, ways that facial recognition is being used. First, for private business security systems, things like uh, security cameras for companies, one is provided by Panasonic. It has a lot of features which are relatively useful for that sort of thing. It's primarily to track people who go into a single business or office multiple times um, and kind of monitor that sort of thing for security purposes. So if there's any incident, that can kind of be traced back and identified. These aren't really designed to scale. They're not really designed to work with existing infrastructure or hardware like web cameras. And even though it's simple, it requires purchasing the entire infrastructure, meaning cameras, using that software, and kind of working out the issues of storage and data portability, which you don't have control over since it's closed source. Uh, in other implementations, we've seen a lot in the news about such uh, places such as China where facial recognition has been used as visibly as people being caught jaywalking, having their face shown on a camera at the intersection, and then having a fine mailed to them. Even though this is somewhat far away, it's not to say that the sort of same sort of thing isn't going on in the U.S. In the U.S., we have the Homeland Advanced Recognition Technology Database, which looks for things like the face, uh, physical descriptors, potentially voice data, on as many as 500 million people. This isn't really specific enough because we simply can't get that data as to what this actually contains or who it contains. Uh, other services like recognition made by Amazon are sold to local police departments. And even here in Los Angeles, uh, the LAPD uses a piece of software made by Palantir, uh, which has had some interesting implications. While it's completely proprietary and we can't really say what it does, there, have been research, there has been research done to suggest, as the quote says here, that 2% of residents who responded to the survey reported being stopped by police between 11 and 30 times a week or more, while 76% uh, reported not, never being stopped at all. So that's mean a very small percentage of people are being stopped very frequently because of these machine learning algorithms which are trained on potentially biased data. So machines aren't biased, but biased training data being applied to real world situations can be very dangerous. And to kind of emphasize this, currently the DHS has a biometric database containing around 125 million biometric records, 2% of the world's population, and expects substantial growth in that database. So in order to kind of understand how these systems are being used and how we can protect ourselves against them or implement them, we can go through a little bit on how they actually work. The first step of facial recognition is detecting faces. This is a completely separate process than some of the other sorts of things for recognition. In fact, facial recognition uses about three different neural networks to do different functions at different times. So there are a few different ways to do facial detection. One issue in this specific part of facial recognition is speed. One of the things that solved this was the Viola Jones object detection framework. This used little boxes of high contrast areas, overlaid them to look for shapes. This is something that you'd see commonly on something like the screen shown here on a digital camera or phone where faces are being identified. Now, this is a very rough way to approximate faces. And as such, that's a lot of the reason why if you've ever used a digital camera, seen the screenshots where it's like, oh, is there a ghost in this corner? Why is it finding a face in the dark? It's just kind of a level of contrast. Now, what's being used in modern systems is a different technique. So some previous uh, research on evading facial recognition were these uh, styles, which were done by Adam Harvey of CV Dazzle. These looked for these high contrast levels that the Viola Jones object detection framework looked for and placed kind of spoofing agents within the face in order to overcome these. What's interesting is even at looking how extreme these uh, styles are, they do not work against the current systems. Uh, the modern way being used to do facial de detection is histogram of oriented gradients. This takes a black and white image, it looks for levels of contrast and kind of creates almost pixel-like units of 
percentage of contrast and in increase. So it takes things like a nose being brighter than the corners behind it and turns this into something where it can be measured numerically and compared to it, things which are known faces. This is effective even against this sort of style because it can still identify those core facial features. So the next step, which actually is more important when it comes to doing facial rec recognition, is landmark estimation. Once a face is isolated in a picture, uh, it, you need to be able to actually numerically compare it to other faces in order to identify them. One example of this is DLibC, which has a facial recognition library, which looks for 68 points, which can be roughly approximated on any given face. Some models look for as many as 194, which is more accurate, but of course requires higher resolution data as well. Models uh, define individual points or landmarks. These are assumed to exist on all, and once you have those points, you can measure the distance between them. The actual math behind this is much beyond my level of understanding. I've linked a paper on it in the bottom uh, there, one millisecond face uh, alignment with an ensemble of regression trees. Uh, I have a link to that paper in the last slide here. I can honestly say I don't understand it. But I'd like to emphasize that in not understanding any of these low-level mathematical operations going on in machine learning, I was able to build a perfectly functional facial recognition system that could do mass surveillance-like behaviors in just a few hundred, levels of, hundred lines of high-level code. So once these landmarks are detected, they're centered and kind of made so that either a person turning their face or a person with an asymmetrical face would not have that counted out. So rather than necessarily looking for a face at a specific angle, the points are referenced and scaled in order to average them so people's faces at different angles or with partially covered faces could still be positively identified. Some examples of these different facial landmark um, estimation examples are shown here in these images. You can see the upper left is how it should actually behave. Uh, the right is, shows a partial issue with obfuscation, but even though you can see that the left eye in that image is slightly off, because of the way that the averages are done in order to estimate them, a, you can still actually make positive identification, and that face is a sufficient amount of detail to m do recognition against thousands or potentially hundreds of thousands other faces. Uh, as goes for the lower left, uh, metal style corpse paint is not usually enough because it doesn't really violate the substantial features which you'd need to change in order to overcome facial recognition. Most amusingly, at the lower right, I found that Juggalo face paint does in fact often overcome this because the places of the jawline in specific are completely redefined with that high level of contrast. Even though the features, the core features, such as the nose, eyes, and mouth, are able to be identified accurately since those are very difficult to move without completely obscuring them, the jawline was almost completely spoofed with the high level of contrast there. Something which was found to be very amusing by news agencies. I would have wished they focused a little bit on the ethical implementations of facial recognition, but it was funny. I was entertained. Um, in other examples, some severe obfuscation techniques I've seen suggested online really don't do anything. Even though these are drawn on a secondary level of eyes, because the algorithms have such predefined distances between different points, this doesn't overcome facial recognition. Nor does things like this. As interesting as they look, uh, the landmarks can still be placed very well. What I would like to emphasize, though, for overcoming facial recognition with this as an example, is that you can see the mouth is slightly changed in shape. And this is something that I've found to be more accurate with modern facial recognition techniques. Rather than trying to completely hide or redefine features, trying to expand them or kind of transform them while maintaining existing lines of your face is somewhat more effective. So training a neural network to do facial recognition is one of the most important parts because you need to be able to figure out what faces look like, compare them to other faces, and this is something that you can't really manage with traditional algorithms. Luckily, these models are pretty much fully developed and existing and open source. So training a deep convolutional neural network to generate these 128 measurements between the previously found 68 points allows us to have a set of data which we can compare numerically to other faces to make a match. The training process is something which also takes a lot of time or power, but because of the way that machine learning works, you can have a pre-trained model and really not have to use any computing power and just take that data which is already existing.
Uh, what I used for my personal project was uh, face underscore rep recognition, which is a library for Python, which is kind of a wrapper for dlibc, which does the actual detection, um, placement of points, as well as taking those measurements. So one thing which is interesting when coming from kind of traditional data management structures, how do you actually deal with biometric data? Now, normally with data, you'd have something like an index. If something's going into a database, you can order it alphabetically, you can order it by its number, its size, a lot of things like that. When you're comparing faces in a database, you have 128 different measurements that you can't simply take one as the index. Uh, this is among some of the other issues that we've seen with managing all the metadata that comes from when you're taking in different cameras and different sources, correlating people, gathering new faces, making sure that there aren't collisions. Dealing with biometric data is something that's still very new and something that even many government surveillance systems have kind of had documented issues regarding. One thing that's interesting, though, is that because of social media, the publicly placed cameras, which are altogether common now, you don't need to fully construct a new facial recognition system or database to be able to still monitor people effectively. One way that this was shown that um, in Russia, VK.RU or VContact uh, had basically a lack of limiting or rate limiting on requesting profile pictures. So this company, FindFace, basically requested every single profile picture and URL for every user on VK. Then they trained that, um, they trained a facial recognition model on that, and now they have a website where you can take a picture of someone and look them up and find their social media just with their face. Interestingly, because this um, actual secondary kind of metadata of facial recognition data isn't taking pictures of people, it's taking measurements, there is a lot less regulation on how this is actually even legal. Like, storing facial recognition data is not regulated whatsoever. Even though taking pictures of people can be in certain contexts, facial recognition data specifically, those measurements which could be used to identify people, is very much metadata which is not being managed or regulated in any way. And additionally, I'm sure some of us in the room are familiar with Shodan. The availability of webcams and cameras that are either weakly secured or completely uh, open kind of means that you can take existing uh, hardware, develop new firmware for it, or manage those feeds to create kind of a secondary, almost like secret sneaker net facial recognition system of just open source data. So this data farming of things which could be used for marketing. One example might be someone taking uh, a facial recognition scanner outside of like a um, hospital or something like that and selling that data to insurance companies. As of right now, that wouldn't necessarily be illegal because it's not taking photos and it's not even necessarily tying a name to that data. And because of that, nobody can even say if that's currently being done. So managing this facial recognition data is very different to managing usual data, but a lot of the same systems can still be used. In my case, I used uh, PostgreSQL, same as any other SQL syntax, more or less, but I had to do some special tricks to manage that data. Rather than comparing images one by one, to determine the image of a match, we have this pre-computed version, which is these 128 measurements. This set was generated by the neural network. We can format in a way where each of these are set as dimensions which can be individually sorted in our database. So the formula we do that with is Euclidean distance, because rather than normal kind of database sorting where you have a single index and it's just is this something larger, smaller, higher number, lower number, you need to be able to manage those 128 dimensions in multi-dimensional shape. You, what you want is the average of how similar those 128 dimensions are to another set of 128 dimensions. That's very different to normal database management, but it is something that can be handled by the existing technology. In my case, I used Postgres, which had a cube function. This was previously being limited to 100 dimensions. However, by, custom, by compiling Postgres yourself, you can change a single line in kubedata.h to change it to 128 dimensions. And then from there, I was able to sort these kind of as what it treated as multi-dimensional cubes, meaning this 128 dimensions in multiple space could be indexed and the similarity could be compared numerically just using an existing database system. So the sort that I actually used to do that is pretty much regular SQL syntax, order by, face encoding, and then the distance being the cube array, which includes the face encoding. To reference kind of how this data actually scales, um, each entry is around four kilobytes, very small, meaning every 250,000 entries is around one gigabyte. 
At that rate, the entire world population could be in less than 30 terabytes, and practically anyone within that could be recognized. With high quality photos uh, at consistent angles, I haven't managed to create any collision as to where two people were actually being matched as the same, even using data like twins. And I honestly found that the facial recognition software is better at differentiating twins than I was. So there's a lot of kind of like, well, how, won't we, how will we be able to scale this? Won't people, aren't there too many people who look the same? And the fact is, facial recognition data has enough detail to differentiate a practically infinite amount of people as of with the current world population. Um, tested to around 50,000 entries in the test database, it retrieves results consistently in less than a second on regular computer hardware, meaning it's not really difficult to build a facial recognition system and it's not an issue of hardware speed. So how would you actually de go about deploying an open source facial recognition or mass surveillance system? In my case, I was using totally open source software with a pretty reasonable stack. I'd have something like a camera or maybe a crawler looking on social media. It would send that to Python where I was, had a little script running which would map those facial coordinates, do the detections, all the things which were mentioned in the initial facial recognition steps, see if any faces are there. If not, it skips. Uh, and then it checks that if there is a face found, it compares any faces in a given image, video, or so on to the database. If it's found, a new entry is added, as well as metadata as to where that's coming from, be it social media or a camera. And if no match is found, then it adds a new entry as well as that metadata. This is all being implemented with just Python, Postgres, basic SQL, high-level programming languages in probably less than a few hundred lines of code, which is not difficult at all. This was a project that with very limited experience programming, I was able to finish in less than a month, which makes you think that if I can create a functional mass surveillance system in practically a couple weeks, that companies are surely doing this, governments we know are doing this, and more likely, more people are doing this sort of surveillance that we aren't noticing because there is no regulation on it whatsoever. So I used face underscore recognition for the facial recognition. Um, Psi COPG2 for the database requests, and then iCrawler for web crawling. These are all very simple, fun Python libraries. So even though facial recognition can seem really daunting, the main shift to make is how you treat data and how you look at data gathering. It's very similar to any other sort of data based um, programming or development, but in working in multiple dimensions and working with te techniques that you haven't necessarily seen used before. In the same sense though, all of these things are completely available and developed. Even though facial recognition seems like the same thing I see when I look at the research papers where it's just a bunch of math that I definitely can't understand, you really don't have to work with that now. And that kind of, to some point, scares me in how easy this actually is to do. But it's also very interesting because I'm sure that we're going to see a lot more of this being used and potentially more publicly in the future. I'd like to conclude with a few references. Uh, the first one is a very good tutorial which provides most of the information you need to implement facial recognition using Python. Uh, Euclidean distance and n-dimensional space which goes through some of the issues and functions of having um, multi-dimensional data being managed in the database system. And then finally, a paper which kind of explains the um, landmark placement of facial recognition. So that's about it. If I have time, can I do questions? Any questions? So uh, you, you have a private database that you're growing with a crawler? No, I have not. I have, I, I have. <laughs> this is theoretical? I've written the crawlers and I've tested them to around three entries which I owned as a test thing. It was just one of those things where it's like, hey, theoretically this is not regular at all. I don't want to do it. So uh, ha have, you, have you considered like uh, the challenges of scaling that where people don't have pictures of their face um, in social media? And that's skewing your data set? I mean, in general, it would just discard that face. So like, let's say like the training model for crawling that would be, it would look through profiles if there is a high quality enough face that it matches it. What's more difficult I've found is when there are other people's faces, where it's like pictures of friends or so on. What I've tried to do a little bit with that is, based, is focused on Instagram, where I would look through kind of a set of photos, find the faces, which is a kind of low computational power process. Like let's say just, only include their photos with faces and include the face that's most commonly seen.
which isn't necessarily effective, but you can also kind of emphasize that in the data or like mark that metadata to say, yeah, this might not be right. Several years ago, really started to like this thing. And I guess Apple, the iPhoto has, where it tags everybody, and iPhoto has always failed to distinguish my brother and I. Um, and I've always thought, well, that makes sense that it has trouble with it because that's like a kind of edge case. So I was surprised um, to hear you say that that this was better at it uh, from what you saw than, than what you could eyeball yourself. I, I think the main issue with kind of those like high detail levels of recognition thing are the quality of the photo and the size of the database and the threshold of that match. So let's say, like, my conditions for reference were, like, kind of perfect conditions. This was, like, a photo which was at least maybe 1,200 pixels, roughly high, um, with that's just kind of a close crop of the face. Same angle, same exact thing. And with that, you can have kind of increasing detail of how accurately those landmarks are placed and the threshold of how they're compared. So. To emphasize that for twins, I would say it's extremely effective in high detail situations. But that goes for general facial recognition too, a low resolution photo, uh, just a photo where the face is ob obscured. What you need to do, to, at least to have an effective scale database, is take those and say, oh, this is either too, qual this is too low quality, I won't add it, or I'll mark this as low quality and treat it with less weight. So there's a lot of weighting and kind of evaluation you have to do because no, no match that isn't the exact same photo is going to ever have 100% accuracy. And that's kind of one of the issues that you kind of have to jump to when switching from regular programming. It's not going to be one equals one on a match. So you have to set a threshold and determine what's acceptable based on the conditions. Or at least you, you need to have automatically implemented things like checking the photo resolution, the size of the photo as it happens, and either being able to discard those or treat them as lesser data. I mean, it, it can be fairly low, I would say. Maybe a photo that's 200 by 200 pickle, pixels, that's like a close crop of the face. It, it doesn't need an exceptional level of detail if it's a good photo, but there are definitely, like, a, a lot of security camera footage is not high enough quality. Part of the part about this project is uh, the aggregation of data and how you're able to tie all that data to a single, like, human space. Um, did you consider other sources of uh, data that might be location-based, like, uh, Absolutely. Social media is kind of the most broadly used. That's what I was focusing on. But I've also done some research on using dating app APIs, where a lot of people have very personal information, personal connections and things like that going in, as well as things which could be used to kind of be dangerous in certain places. So th there's a lot of data that's publicly available and people are willing to put out there because they think it can't be correlated to them. But if they have a face on that profile, they, there's kind of a point now where you have to realize that that's not necessarily the case. Even if something online isn't associated to your name or you in any way, as soon as these facial recognition pieces of information are actually being indexed, that can be tied back to you. Uh, which is interesting and mostly dangerous because I really have difficulty thinking of situations where that's good. How does it handle uh, kind of natural changes to a face over time, like you know, getting older, gaining, losing weight, that kind of thing? Uh, gaining and losing weight is only relevant on kind of the extreme end, and aging tends not to affect it. One thing that can be done is, depending on the level of quality of the data, uh, this goes for things too where it's like, let's say, concealing like the lower half of a face with a mask or something. You can focus on specifically the eyes. You can focus on kind of things which won't change, being like the mouth, eyes, nose relative positions, whereas generally with age and um, weight change, it's just kind of a change in the jawline. So, in general, I haven't seen it enough to be over the thresholds for most matches. Um, there are some extreme cases where it has, but those can also be kind of countered against. I was going to tell you into Jared's question, I guess. Um, I've seen matches.
is there a good way other than like wearing Juggalo paint in order to uh, get around this? I, one thing with, uh, let's say the Juggalo face paint in general, all the facial features are still there and it's kind of tricking the automatic detection. Let's say you had somebody manually place those 68 points, that makeup wouldn't be enough. Really the only ways that I've seen so far to actually overcome facial recognition also kind of overcome human recognition. I know that that's a, that's a funny reference point, but like, if you're wearing a mask, other people you know might not be able to recognize you immediately either. So anything where you're both re recognizable to people you know, but actually over the threshold of a match, I've not seen it. And that's something I've been working on trying to find and have not seen. Have you look, have done any research into like what I think it might be the next step in this kind of uh, tracking and recognition? Is like, make, like using you know like live video streams and matching people's gait and stuff across video instead of Yes, definitely. I mean, I mean, that's kind of like the traditional surveillance system thing, kind of like what you see in China where it's like body cameras and publicly placed things. I, I've worked on that a little bit. There's a lot of issues of quality with it, but it's definitely going to develop, I think. I would imagine that the challenge is dealing with that much being video is more data you've got to juggle around, or what's the, I guess, what's the limiting factor of taking it to that? I, I, when you work with video, you take a still. So what you might be running is the first thing where it's looking for a histogram of gradients to just kind of identify faces. And when there's a face, it takes a still and then determines if that's high enough resolution to map the face and use it for recognition data. Is there a way you can combine this with blocking to ruin everyone's privacy at the same time? As much as I, I hate the idea of applying blockchain technology to this, it just seems like two terrible things being combined into something worse. Um, <laughs> I do think that, it, let's say if you had something which was kind of, I'm going to say distributed ledger rather than blockchain because it doesn't really need the coin type quantities or qualities you often see with that. You could have something where people could just like, let's say an entry is new facial recognition data that's over the threshold of that ledger. And then anyone can add comments of like, I hate this person. If they're recognized on your camera, fight them. Like, yeah, that's an option and that data would never go away and it would be tied to something you basically can't change but that anyone can access if you're in public. So I, I don't like the idea of it, but it's completely technologically feasible. So the interesting part is if you take something like this from a surveillance system point of view and you correlate it with your cell phone tower, then you have an arrow group of people to compare in that area. Yeah, one thing I've, I've looked into as well is like correlating it with things like uh, mobile phone or laptop probe frames, like kind of passive reconnaissance on that level, voice recognition, just seeing how much metadata you can kind of get these cross sections of and have extremely detailed portraits of individual people. Um, have you looked into, say, say a person's face is obscured uh, totally except for the eyes, would that be enough for facial recognition software? Uh, it depends on, the, it comes down to resolution much more so at that point, because kind of the more data points you have, the less specificity you need. It can absolutely be done with just a picture of the eyes or even just a picture of the iris, but you need to have a model specifically trained for that, and you need to have a level of detail that's access, acceptable. A full face is more detailed than just kind of the eyes area, but if you have a good enough photo of that section, you can definitely do it with only that. So, hypothetically, the nation state was <laughs> I just said that they get them at the border and they take a picture of them. Would that be enough to track them using public security cameras or would the security cameras also have to have high res? The security cameras would end up being kind of the bottleneck in that because generally speaking it wouldn't be high enough quality. Uh, and when what I've seen when it's been used to kind of uh, unmask, for lack of a better word, protesters, it's been with high resolution photographs that were just stills and then kind of compiled. So higher quality than even video. Uh, diminished on a security camera. You have, let's say, a 4K security camera. You're eight megapixels at a 90 degree uh, field of view. At 25 feet is where you the 100 pixel per foot mark is. And that's what you use typically from, from the security camera perspective to say I can identify that face if I get a good face, you know, straight on shot. Only 25 feet. So you really need to have either a very narrow field of view and really hit the person's face if you want to get those kind of results. To emphasize that, the current cameras being used for facial recognition on nation state level are specialized for it. 
a lot of times they'll zoom in and focus specifically on faces, even if it's not to monitor those people, just to kind of have a snapshot of everyone in a public place and kind of have an automated detection and zoom focus function. Yeah, these are really cool camera setups where they have one camera that's wide angle and one that does right the focus. Hey, let's get the face. On this and, and that's kind of what you need yeah. for that in a public area. So. I think it's interesting that this can just be applied to any existing camera because it's kind of it's just dealing with that data. But to do it effectively, you definitely need specialized equipment. Any other questions? Maybe not, not such an important question, but I'm just curious about um, like iPhoto is the only place I've ever done any thinking about this. I work with a guy who uh, he and his wife uh, like every year to their uh, vacations in different parts of India. And when he started using iPhoto, uh, it was like, um, the, you know, it began to recognize people and what's this person's name and all this. And he started seeing that it, it was always coming up with pictures of uh, Buddha from Buddha statues. And so eventually he was like, just make it go away and just said Buddha. And uh, so then it began to recognize that. And I'm just wondering if in your research, if you came across other things that were not actually false positives, but just things that were not helpful that the software was finding and that you needed to make go away. Hey, I never found any non-face false positives, which I think is something kind of interesting. Um, but I, I did definitely see it happen with, let's say, like very low quality pictures of statues, things like that, something where a face is being represented, especially when you realize that the first step of doing the histogram of gradients discards all color or any information like that, because it goes to black and white immediately. So. Another one too, like with that like eyes painted on the face, I, I found it very difficult to generate false positives which aren't faces whatsoever. Any other questions? All right, thank you.